This is the fifth Sunday of the month, obviously. And usually on the fifth Sunday of the month, we have communion. But this month, we had communion a little bit earlier uh, to celebrate Passover. And so I decided today that we would do something just a little bit different. You see, I'm a little concerned that if we do something too often, it loses its meaning. It's lo it loses its specialness. And so we become just rotely doing that which we are doing, and it loses all of the meaning. So today I thought rather than actually participating in communion, that we would talk about our communion with God. That we would look at what our daily communion looks like. How strong is it? Uh, perhaps it could use a little bit of help. This morning, we had read for us uh, part of the story that we're going to be looking at in John chapter 21, when Jesus asked his disciples to come into a closer relationship, come into a communion uh, relationship with him as uh, he invited them to breakfast. But before we delve into the study this morning, let's pray. Father, this morning, we seek your guidance. We seek your direction. We seek your face. We desire to have communion with thee that is real and personal and intimate and close, warm, all of the qualities that we desire in an intimate relationship. But sometimes we may find ourselves not quite in that intimate relationship. So this morning, help us to delve into the scriptures to look at these, your disciples, and what you did and what they did to develop a relationship with you that's real and personal. So God, our hearts and our understanding this morning, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I trust that you have your Bibles and that they're open to John chapter 21, and you'll follow along as we look at this very important passage of Scripture. The first thing we notice is the interruption in their life. The interruption that had happened. Jesus had been crucified. This was a post-resurrection experience that we're looking at. Jesus had been crucified. He had been in the tomb for three days. He had resurrected. He had shown himself to his disciples. And now he was meeting with them on the shores of Galilee. They were at a loss. They didn't really know what to do with themselves. Jesus had resurrected. The tomb was empty. Jesus was not there. He came into the room and saw them uh, gathered together and then disappeared again. And he had told them, according to Mark, to go to Galilee, that he would see them in the Galilee. So they went to the shores of the Galilee where they were familiarly, familiar with, and they waited. But what were they going to do while they were waiting? When they got there, obviously Jesus wasn't already there. He had a plan and a purpose. So Peter, the impetuous guy, decides he's going to go fishing. Now maybe he was ashamed of his previous failures and just had decided, hey, I'm a loser. I'm going back to fishing, my old job. Maybe he doesn't feel like he belongs with the disciples any longer. He's been the one that's been braggadocious, that has said, I'll go with you even to death. You don't have to worry about me. Now, I don't know about these guys, but you don't have to worry about me, Lord. And he was the one that denied him three times, and Jesus heard him face to face. That's an awful thing to live with. Maybe it was just the fact that Peter enjoyed fishing, and he wanted to do something he enjoyed doing. There's nothing wrong with fishing, not anything at wrong. But one of the things we note in here is that his decision affected others. So sometimes when we have decisions that may run contrary to what we know we should be doing, we may think it only affects us, but it affects others as well. Peter said in here, in the latter part of, ver in, well, in verse 3, he said, I'm going fishing. And the other disciples said to him, we're going with you. Maybe they hadn't thought of fishing as an opportunity or as an option, 
But because Peter mentioned it, they said, we're going with you. And so Peter's decision affected the lives of these other men as well. But the Scripture tells us that while these men were professionals, and they were, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, and John, two other disciples that are unnamed, they were professional fishermen for the most part, and yet they fished all night and caught nothing. They had lost their knack for fishing. For some reason, they caught nothing. Now, that, that has to be discouraging. It has to be discouraging for any fisherman. But for someone who is a professional that did that every day, every night, uh, for their livelihood, to come back and to catch absolutely nothing in their nets must have been a real disappointment. But along with that interruption, they received an unsolicited invitation the morning has dawned it's early in the morning they fished all night and they see a form of someone standing on the shore verse 4 they didn't know who it was but this individual said children do you have any food have you caught anything and they answered, no, not a thing. And so this stranger said to them, throw your net on the right side of the boat. Now, for a professional fisherman, this may have angered them. It may have frustrated them. Who does this stranger think he is telling us to try to throw it on the right side of the boat? We've been doing it all night. We've thrown it on the right side. We've thrown it on the left side. We've thrown it in the back. We've thrown it all over the place, and we've caught nothing. But nonetheless, they did what the stranger said to do. And when they cast the net on the right side of the boat, they found that the stranger on the bank knew what he was talking about. They caught a multitude of fish instantaneously there was a multitude of fish and John it says here the disciple whom Jesus loved John always referred to himself by that title knew immediately who it was he had seen something similar to this before when Jesus was in their presence and he said it is the Lord Peter jumps into the water and races to him. The stranger on the bank has been discovered, and he issues to them an invitation, an invitation for intimacy, an invitation for closeness, an, intimate, uh, an invitation for a deeper relationship and fellowship with them. He said to them, come, and bring some of your fish with you that you just called. Verse 10. Come and join with me where I'm working. Come, put your catch with what I already have. Jesus is at work around us. He's wanting us to join him in the work. So many times we pray, Lord, what do you want me to do? When what we should be praying is, Lord, open my eyes to help me see where you are already working so that I may join you in that work. Just a few verses later on in verse 12, he invites them to come and eat with me, to spend time with me. As most of you know, my wife died 17 and a half years ago. And one of the things that I really miss and have missed in these 17 and a half years is table talk. Oh, sometimes we sit at the table and we may not have said anything, but it was just the presence of being there in the company of someone you cared for. But most of the time, we rehearsed our day. 
she would tell me some of the things that she had encountered in, in her work, and I would tell her some of the things that I had encountered in my work. We would discuss some of the things that were going on in the churches that we were serving at that time, uh, some of the friends, some of the family. We would talk. And as we talked, the meal went a little longer than normal. I have been in restaurants by myself and eating a meal, and I get up and go, and the waitress may come to me and say, well, it didn't take you long to eat. You weren't here long. And I said, it doesn't take long to eat when you're eating by yourself. You don't have anybody to talk to. You don't have any conversation. You don't have any fellowship. But when you're sitting there with someone else, it makes the meal more enjoyable and it prolongs the fellowship. I always enjoy meeting someone for a meal. It makes the meal taste so much better when you can have some table talk to go with it. And Jesus was inviting these disciples, these seven men, to come to him and to enter into a time of fellowship with him, a deeper walk. And I believe this morning he's sending out that same invitation to us that he wants us to come and dine, to come and feast on him, to come and spend time with him, to feast on his word and to enter into a relationship with him that is real and personal. Do you have that kind of relationship this morning with Jesus Christ? Do you know him in that intimacy, in that close walk? That's what he wants. He doesn't want just a high and by, a casual passing through. He wants intimacy, closeness with you. But this invitation brought to them a deeper relationship with Jesus and a time for introspection. A time to go deeper. Introspection is a time to reflect, a time to look inward and to think about yourself and where you are in relationship to where the other person is as well. Jesus started this time of introspection with some stirring questions. After the meal, Jesus said to them, And basically to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And the first thing we see here is he used the word Simon, not Peter. If we remember back in Mark, or Matthew rather, chapter 16, they're on the mount there and Jesus has asked them, whom do you say that I, uh, who do people say that I am? And they responded. He said, who do you think I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said to him, Simon, Bar Jonah, a son of Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven, you shall be called Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. Upon this revelation that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. And from that point on, he was referred to as Peter. But now Jesus goes back to his original name, to his Jewish name, and says, Simon, do you love me more than these? And I believe, honestly, that he was saying, do you love me more than these fish? Not more than these disciples. I don't think Jesus ever puts us into a a competition that I love you more than I love him. Maybe he was because Peter had said earlier, I'll follow you. I don't know about these guys, but I'll follow you to death. In other words, you can count on me. But I think really Jesus was saying, Peter, you got a choice to make. Are you going to go fishing for the rest of your life? Or do you love me enough to trust me and follow me? A third observation here is that Jesus said to him, Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? 
that God kind of love, that self-sacrificing kind of love, that, that ultimate love that will give and give and give even though it doesn't get anything in return. This is God's kind of love, the agape kind of love. He said, Peter, do you love me with all your heart, your soul, your spirit, with everything that is in you? Do you love me? And Peter said, in his incomplete response. Yes, Lord. You know that I'm very fond of you. I phileo you. I like you. Even at that, when Peter didn't have the right answer that Jesus was perhaps hoping for, he gave to him a commission and said, Feed my lambs. And then he turned to him a second time and said, Peter, or, or Simon, do you agape me? Do you love me with that self-sacrificing love? And Peter said again, Lord, you know that I like you. Now let me ask you a question. Suppose you were looking into the eyes of your spouse or maybe when your spouse was your boyfriend or your girlfriend before you were married. And you called their name and said, do you love me with all your heart? And they responded, yeah, I like you. How would that make you feel? You were looking for a deeper relationship, a deeper love, and they responded with, yeah, I like you. Kind of like I like ice cream or chocolate cake. I like you. That's what Peter was saying. And so Jesus asked him a third time, three questions, but this third question was more penetrating because he said to Simon, Simon, do you like me? Simon, do you phileo me? And Peter was grieved, it says, because he said to him the third time, Peter, or Simon, do you like me? You see, Simon Peter wasn't able to come up to the level and expectation that Jesus had for him. And so what did Jesus do? Did Jesus said, well, if you can't come up to my expectations, forget you. I'm leaving. No. Jesus came down to Peter's level. And if you're this morning not able to come up to the level of devotion and communion and uh, intimacy with Jesus Christ that he desires for you to have, he doesn't turn his back on you. He doesn't go away. He comes to where you are and meets you right where you are and works in your heart to transform you, to take you to where he wants you to be. He said to him that third time, and he gave him another commission, feed my sheep. There were three denials that happened just before the cross. Peter had said, I'll follow you to the death. But when the time came, he denied knowing Jesus three times. Three denials. Three times he said, I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know the man. And Jesus heard that third time. Now, after the resurrection, Jesus is on the shore with Peter. And he asks him three times, Simon, do you agape me? Simon, do you agape me? Simon, do you... Phileo me? 
do you like me? And he gave him a commission. You see, it doesn't matter what you have done or where you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ right now. He is standing there with open arms to take you where you are and make you into what he wants you to be. You say, but I can't do this, I can't do that, or I failed here, or I turned my back on Him, I rejected Him. It doesn't matter, my friend. You haven't done anything any worse than what Peter did. And yet Peter was commissioned. And Peter became the powerful preacher at Pentecost. God could have used any one of his disciples, any one of the disciples or men that were there to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But who did he use in the book of Acts chapter 2? Peter stood up and Peter started preaching and 3,000 souls were saved. Peter became the apostle to the Gentiles as he went and ministered, preaching the gospel faithfully. Peter thought he was finished. Jesus saw him as just getting started. How is your communion with God? How is your relationship with God? with God this morning? Is it close and intimate? You have a daily quiet time? Spend a lot of time in prayer and Bible reading? I heard of a conference that was uh, conducted uh, some time back with uh, several thousand Christians together. And they were asked the question of how much time do you spend in prayer? And out of these, I think it was 10,000 Christians that were gathered together in this conference, the average amount of time that the Christians spent in prayer per day was five minutes. Five minutes per day. Now, there were some 4,000 preachers in this group, they were polled also. They did a little better. Their average was seven minutes a day. How's your prayer life? How's your intimacy with Jesus? Is it close and intimate? Or is it loose and informal? More like that of kind of off and on, mostly off calling upon Him when you need Him, maybe praying at meals, casual reading of the Bible once in a while. You at least know where your Bible is at home and can find it fairly easily. Or is your relationship cold and indifferent? Cold and indifferent. You don't really think much about God. You don't think much about Jesus Christ and about His walk with you. You don't think much about it during the course of the day. You come to church maybe and read your Bible every now and then, but it's not a regular thing. You're not going to be back multiple times during the week. Once is enough. It's not a really big deal for you, the relationship. You just come and do your thing and you leave. The truth is, my friend, God knows what your relationship is. I can look out over the group here and think that all of us have that close, intimate relationship and would like to think that all of us have that. And maybe you put forth that kind of um, attitude, that kind of uh, persona towards those that are around you, that you are, you've got it all together and you've got a close relationship with God, but you don't. God knows the truth about your communion. You can't fool him. You can fool others, but not him. This morning, he's tenderly calling you by name, individually, to a deeper walk with him. To come and feast with him in his word. 
to come and spend time with Him and allow Him to give you that which you need for the day, the week, the month that is ahead. And the thing about it is, it's kind of like the manna in the wilderness. He doesn't give you a month's supply at one time. He gives you daily what you need. That's why He said in that model prayer, give us this day our daily bread. What we need for today, what we need for right now. And that's what he wants, a daily conversation with you. When you're riding down the road, you don't have to close your eyes to pray. Hopefully you don't if you're driving. But you can commune with God. You can listen to things that are uplifting, to to music that is going to uplift you and bring you into his presence. Worship music sermons, things that are going to impact you and bring you into a relationship with Him. You say, but that's, that's so boring. No, it's not. If you're in love with Him, it's not boring. It, it's never boring to be in the presence of the person you love, to be in communication, to be in dialogue with the person you love. This morning, my friend, He's calling you tenderly, gently, personally, to enter into a relationship with Him that is real and personal, to go deeper in your relationship and communion with Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning we come to a time of decision, a time of choice. We can walk out of here just as we walked in, unchanged, unmotivated, undecided, perhaps. And yet, in that indecision, we have made a decision, and that is to reject your offer of intimacy. We may be here this morning and feel that we are doing pretty good in our relationship. It's close and pretty intimate, But there's always room for more. There's always room for a closer walk with you. And you're always open to that. I don't believe any of us ever get to the point in our life where we say, okay, enough is enough. We always want more. More love, O Christ, to thee. So this morning, as you're speaking to our hearts, and you are, you said you would be here. And you are, and you, through your Spirit, are drawing us in our hearts. And we can choose to allow our desire to go and eat lunch, or to meet friends, or to take care of something else, to overshadow your call for intimacy, or we can say, Lord, right now, it's more important for me to deal with this question, this question of intimacy and and communion with you, than it is to do anything else. And so right now, I'm going to deal with that, and I'm going to choose intimacy with you, closeness with you. And you would come and say by your coming, Lord, this is what I desire, a close, intimate relationship with you that's real and personal. So move in our hearts right now, as you tenderly call us to go deeper with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand?